Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. I think you're going to find that um, the next hour or so is going to be just a really awesome time uh, for you. I've done a little research on our speaker today, and um, she's actually... Um, I'm just I'm just very excited to hear from her myself. She's an amazing person. Um, I'm Debbie Corum. I'm the director of athletics here at Southern Utah University, and um, I, I've had the privilege of being um, asked to introduce Kafitha to you today. Um, it, and, and I hope that after you hear from her today, you'll go and Google her yourself and 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 um, read some of her blogs and. Um, some of her podcasts and things like that that are uh, that are out there um, because you I think you'll find that she has a lot of wisdom to share with us. Um, Kafitha, Kafitha is a sports writer. She's based in New York City. Um, she was previously a columnist with ESPN. Um, w and Bloomberg. She's currently blogging for The Athlete, which is something that I read every morning before I get out of bed, actually. That's a confession. Um, and she focuses, on, she focuses on this intersection of sports and business, culture, race, and gender. Um, her work has been published in The Rolling Stone, The Guardian, NBC News, Think. Um, she's been um, noted as in, in the best American sports writing um, recognition. She's appeared um, on Sports Center, Outside the Lines, CBS. She's a very busy person. CBS, NC, um, CNN, and MSN, MSNBC. Um, she, she uh, probably. I hope she will talk a little bit. I have often people ask me, "What is it like to work in a predominantly male environment?" and um, and, and it has its challenges. But the discriminations that I have felt during my career are nothing compared to what sports journalists, female sports journalists have, have faced during their careers. Um, I used to think when I was young, uh, administrator getting into athletics, why in the world would a female ever want to be a sports journalist? Because I would read often about the discrimination um, that they would face in trying to do their jobs. There were all sorts of things way back in the 80s about um, them coming in the locker rooms and, oh, just why would a female want to, want to do this? So um, I have a great deal of respect for her because I know behind this beautiful smile there's a lot of uh, challenges that she's faced in her life. So I look forward to hearing from her. I hope you do too, and I'll welcome Kavitha. Okay, well, welcome to Kavitha Davidson. Thank you so much. I don't know if I can live up to that introduction or frankly live up to some of the other people who are gonna be here. I am not an aerobatic helicopter pilot, <laughs> um, and nor am I a, magi a magician, but hopefully this will be just as interesting. I'm sure it will be, and we have a, one more introduction to make because I've brought in the big guns for this one um, uh, because we have so much. You, the reason that you're here is because of Dave Berry. So, Welcome, Dave Barry. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Can you tell me, uh, just uh, so in case anybody here doesn't know, we just heard about Kavitha's background, but tell us a little bit about who you are and, and who you are to SUU. Well, I teach, uh, I teach, formerly I teach economics at SUU, and a number of my students are in the audience, and so they know we don't spend a lot of time using that word. Uh, so I teach uh, sports and gender issues, and we should have a lot of, who are the history students? We're not doing any history today. <laughs> there will be no discussion of English monarchs. We won't do that at all. Um, and so, but I teach those types of subjects. So I, I do a lot of stuff with sports and gender, and that's how I've gotten known. Uh, Kavitha here, uh, just talking about issues in women's sports and how women in the sports media are treated. So we're gonna have a nice, really fun conversation for the next hour or so, sort of about all the different issues associated with this and sort of how it intersects with economics and culture and sociology and things of that nature. How Although I was just in Winchester, so if you wanna have a conversation about English monarchs, we can absolutely go there. <laughs> she will be coming to history tomorrow, so we will discuss English monarchs tomorrow. That'll be fantastic. How did you first come to know Kavitha's work? I think, was it you interviewing me? I, I can't remember who interviewed whom first. Um, so we have interviewed each other for articles that we've written and for each other's books. Yes. So I believe when you were at Forbes and I was at Bloomberg, 
I think I interviewed you for an economics of the WNBA piece. Yes, yeah, something along that long, nice lines, yes. Well, I'd love to know, Kavitha, a little bit about your background and kind of how you, a little snapshot of how you got from there to here. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll get into some of the projects that you're involved in now. So if you could just give us a little bit of a background of how you got into all of this. Yeah, I mean, I get asked a lot about, I don't know if you can hear me because I think the mic is pointing into my chest, but um, <laughs> um, I get asked a lot, you know, how did you get into sports? And I don't know if you know, but when you join The Athletic, if you're of a certain position, every you kind of get asked to write this, why I joined The Athletic piece. So you can go online and read that. Um, but basically, I'm a sports fan, and I think nobody gets into sports journalism without being a sports fan, let alone a woman, mm -hmm. um, because of the challenges that, that we've already kind of touched on. But, uh, you know, I grew up in New York City, born and raised Manhattan, uh, and I was seven years old when the Yankees won their first World Series in 96 of the dynasty years. Um, and it was just ingrained in me. Um, and it was, a, it was a class trip, actually, the home opener in 1996, it was the first time I'd ever seen a live sporting event. My family's from India, moved to this country in 1981, and uh, we couldn't afford to go to sports, and it was also just not something that was prioritized. But the headmistress of my middle school loved the Yankees and was like, we need to take these kids to a game. So we went to the home opener. Uh, the Yankees played the Royals in the snow. The Yankees won. It was Andy Pettit bobblehead day. I still have that bobblehead. Oh. <laughs> um, and I just fell in love with it. There was just something about the feeling of being surrounded by 50,000 people, especially in the South Bronx, who none of them looked like each other. 17 different languages were being spoken, old and new and old and young and all of that. But everyone was cheering for this one common thing. And it was this beautiful thing that I just wanted to be a part of, um, let alone like old Yankee Stadium had this sound that it made that you could feel that sound in the pit of your stomach. Like it was this visceral kind of thing. And I guess I've been chasing that sound kind of ever since. Um, but so when I when I got to college, you know, I, I knew I wanted to be a sports writer. I kind of I had this idea in my mind. I actually wanted to be the first female GM of the Yankees, but um, <laughs> uh, and I still think I could do I could do a pretty good job at that. But uh, I, I did a couple of internships with front offices, and I, I kind of learned very quickly that when you learn how the sausage is made it kind of quells your enthusiasm for that. So the journalistic side allows you to be cynical and to criticize this thing that you love with the hope of improving it. Um, so yeah, I was the sports editor at the Columbia Spectator at Columbia where I went um, and, and you know did a couple of, did several internships just trying to keep in the sports uh, realm in the journalism realm. I was an analyst for Nielsen um, in the sports and marketing anal analytics department for a couple of years in college. And then I kind of got my first big break really. Um, I wrote a piece on the history of women in the Olympics in 2012. Mm. Uh, and then in 2013, I joined Bloomberg as a sports columnist. And there's kind of where I started intersecting with the kind of stuff that Dave does, where I focused on the business and economic side with also an eye toward race and gender and culture. Um, but really just using sports as a lens for broader issues in society. And I kind of traced that back to uh, this class that I took. It was the summer between freshman and sophomore year at Columbia and it was at this um, it was at the graduate school. I had to petition to take this class um, and it was called the Socio-Historical Foundations of American Sport. And it was all about how these games that we love and these sports that we watch and these identities that we've cultivated as fans trace their roots back to American history, especially in America, um, and, and, and how these are bigger than just what's happening on the field. And I've kind of tried to take that, that with me throughout my career. Thank you. Well, we're going to get into all of those topics and we're going to talk about gender and race and current events and all those things. I'm really excited to get your take on that. But I'd also love to just know what's going on with you right now. I mean, I know what it is, but for our audience to kind of know that the, you have a, a sort of a new project mm -hmm. um, and then a couple of other things that you're involved in that I'd love to ask about. So what is what's happened in the last couple of months? Yeah. So um, I moved to L.A. in September. Yes. We got I'm on a, the West Coast. <laughs> I'm a born and raised New Yorker. I, you know, again, went to college in Manhattan. I lived my entire life in Manhattan and somehow 
I, I made it out to the West Coast about a month and a half ago. Um, so I joined The Athletic in May as a sports business reporter. We had just launched a sports business media and law vertical um, and kind of going back to my Bloomberg roots there. Uh, and then I moved in September. We, we just launched about a month ago um, our daily podcast. It's called The Lead. Please check us out on on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening. Um, and our idea basically is to do a deep dive on one sports topic every day that kind of goes beyond the box score, goes beyond what's happening on the field, um, and brings it to kind of this larger area. And some of the things can be a little bit wonky. We had an astrophysicist on uh, to talk about uh, the composition of the juiced baseballs in the World Series and going back to the old baseballs and that kind of thing. And then some of, some of the topics that we've talked about have been more wide ranging. We had California Governor Gavin Newsom on a couple weeks ago to talk about a bill that he's introduced to allow uh, college athletes to profit from their names, images, and likenesses. So we're, we're kind of, we're, we're very wide ranging, we're very diverse in what we cover, but that's, that's kind of the new, that's the new project. I've definitely got some specifics on those topics as well. Um, one last kind of thing about what, what you're involved in is I'd love to, you still have a great connection to New York and you're involved with the Yogi Berra Museum? Yeah, so this past summer I joined the board of directors at the Yogi Berra Museum um, out of Montclair, which is where Yogi, Yogi lived. Um, and it's this great, you know, I'm a born and raised Yankees fan. Uh, and, and it's this amazing learning center where, you know, Montclair is a fairly affluent part of New Jersey, um, but the kinds of education programs and the kinds of things that they're doing based on Yogi's legacy are really, are really great. So, you know, we have summer camps where we take kids from public schools in Camden and Newark, which are much poorer areas in New Jersey, and kind of use sports and baseball to teach them um, about U.S. history. Um, so one of the programs we partnered with Seaman in the last two years to teach these kids about some STEM fields. And we actually taught them how to use a 3D printing software, which, you know, I've taken CAD classes. I can't even use these softwares, let alone <laughs> these kids, um, and, and that kind of thing. And it's been this really, really kind of beautiful journey. And one thing that I'm very proud of um, that, that we're launching pretty soon is we've partnered with Teach for America to develop a series of curriculum um, that will be available for free online for teachers everywhere to use where you know we're using Yogi's legacy baseball history and sports history at large to mirror American history oh, so Yogi cool. came from an Italian immigrant family and in the 20th century baseball was a huge vehicle for Italian and Irish immigrants to kind of assimilate from the working classes um, and and those kinds of things are, are the ways that sports can really reach these kids toward what we're talking about immigration today Yogiisms part of the museum? Yogiisms are absolutely if you walk around so the museums a really cool place but if you walk around the museum um, there there are yogiisms everywhere. And one cool thing that we're doing also, we just launched this in partnership with the Negro Leagues, the Negro Leagues Museum out in Kansas City. We have um, a traveling exhibit that's living at the Yogi Berra Museum right now um, about about the history of the Negro Leagues and, and the contributions there. Can you tell there. the students any, of, any specific yogiisms? Um, <laughs> my favorite one is, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase him, I don't have the phrasing right. I don't think even Yogi ever had the phrasing right, <laughs> frankly. Um, but you don't know where you're going until you got there. Yeah, so. oh, Yogi was famous for saying things that I mean, the yeah. ones, it's funny, because some yogiisms have just become part of the national parliament. Yes, like have. deja vu all over again. Deja vu that's all over again, that's a yogiism. Now, deja right? vu all over again, um, yes. That's a yogiism? That's, that's a, a yogiism. yogiism. I didn't know that. It gets, it gets late early out there. He's referring to the shadows at Yankee Stadium directly. It gets um, late early directly, out there, yes. That like around five o'clock, if you're in the third or fourth inning, you have no idea where the ball's going. Um, another great one is nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded. Ah. Yes. Those are great. Wow, I didn't know that at all. And the curriculum you mentioned, that's not yet available, but coming soon. It's not yet available. It is coming soon. And, and again, we touch on a lot of the immigration stuff. We also have a whole section on financial literacy because, frankly, our public school system doesn't teach things like that properly, um, as I'm sure you can speak to. Um, and then also race and gender. And we get into, you know, 
transgender athletes and uh, you know some of like like Latin American immigration and things like that. It's it's a really it's a pretty fascinating thing. And I think you know when you think about something as traditional and old school as baseball, you don't think about that as being the vehicle for having some of these conversations. So I think we're really proud that we can that we can do that. That's very cool. And I'm sure if people go to the there's probably a website that people yes. can start Yogi Berra Museum, Google right. it, and you can find out more. Great. Thank you for yeah. that. Well, I'd love to sort of get into the gender discussion, and I know Dave has a bunch of questions for you about that, but I'd love to start out with a quote um, that I found in my research that I think sort of talks about you, you getting into specifically writing about gender. And you said, when I joined ESPN, I shifted my coverage to writing specifically about women's sports and women's issues in sports, catering to a demographic that remains largely underserved while maintaining my eye toward the realities of the industry. I truly believe that every push toward equal coverage and opportunity starts with a macro view of the business of sports with the understanding that, as in other businesses, financial decisions aren't made in a vacuum, even if they're not always made well. So with that, I'd love to open up the conversation and, and Dave, maybe hand it off to you for a bit. Okay, so let, yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. So let's, let's start off with some, some <laughs> basics about women in sports. So how much of sports coverage is devoted to women? Um, I believe the number is at like 11%. What really? is the 11, actual number? I think it's like 5%. Is it 5%? Isn't it? It's like 5%. We're getting better in recent years, to be honest. But if you, and it also depends on how you measure that, right? So the famous, the famous way to measure that is USC does this, the Annenberg Center does this study yeah. every, so, every few years about the percentage of sports center um, minutes that are devoted to women's sports. It's about 5%. Okay. And, and if, you, if you click on ESPN's website, this is the main page, and just scroll down and just count to yourself. How many stories are men? How many stories are women? How many stories are men? You'll find that on a typical day, you'll see probably about 40 <laughs> stories, and there might be two or three that are about women, and mm. everything else is about men. Even on days where major events happen in women's sports, it's still going to be heavily biased towards men. Uh, and so that's a really, so, so you see that kind of bias. So how many women are sports writers? Um, that's the other thing is our newsrooms are not as diverse as we need them to be, but we, we do actually have, and I'm very proud to say The Athletic has huge gender parity as far as our, our reporters on the ground, but where we do see the divide um, is in the higher echelons. So there are negligible, there's a negligible number of women editors, there's a negligible number of women producers and executive producers on the TV and radio side. Um, and it, the numbers get even worse when you talk about women of color. Yeah, mm. so it's about 10% of sports writers are women. And you're right, as you go up, it gets even less and less and less. So that's, I mean, so when you think about the coverage of sports, why is it so skewed towards men? Well, the people deciding the coverage are also men. Uh, so let's talk about why that is. So uh, one explanation might be it's the market. So yeah, what's thoughts um, on that? There, there's kind of this prevailing idea that women just aren't interested in sports, so we don't want to go for these, for these jobs. Um, but frankly, that's the same line that's being used uh, about why there aren't enough women in STEM or enough women in, you know, uh, in, in finance. And frankly, I think that when you talk about the barriers of entry, it's not necessarily an educational barrier. It's, it's, it's the culture barrier. It's that once you do get to these jobs, it kind of takes a certain thickness of skin to stay in these jobs, right? I mean, Silicon Valley, we can just use as an example, is not a friendly place for women. So if you're a woman looking to get into a STEM field, you're gonna be probably turned off toward tech. That doesn't mean that you have no interest in tech. There are women gamers, but uh, you know, and women programmers. But it's it's about the culture that we foster in these environments um, that discourage women from going into into these kinds of fields. So when we think about women as sports fans, this is something that that men have trouble with. How many women in, in the audience are, are sports fans? Can I see a show of hands? How many women who are sports fans have ever received a quiz from men? So this is, this is a really common thing that women experience. So, so what's the quiz? So women, in, like sports Twitter is a very active place and women's sports Twitter especially, we're a very like uh, large but close knit group. We have all had this experience and I'm sure the women in the audience have where you're at a bar, you're with your friends and somebody you don't know finds out you're a sports fan or in my case, a sports writer 
and it's, oh, who, was, who won the batting title in 1985? <laughs> I could probably give you an educated guess on that. Frankly, this is what we have Google for, and that's not really what my job is. I can rattle off all the statistics I want and that I've chosen to remember, but can you contextualize why who won the batting title in 1985 matters? That sports fan cannot do that, but the entire point of that sports fan, usually a man, saying that is to create another barrier that, oh, you don't belong in this space. You can't possibly have this very intricate knowledge that, mm -hmm. again, he is probably picking and choosing which stats he's, uh, he's quizzing you on. So that, that's something that, always, that you always encounter. And it's just this kind of very aggressive, um, meant to slightly intimidate environment where I mean, the underlying message is you don't belong here, and I'm going to demonstrate the ways in which you don't belong And it here. strikes me as such an odd way to meet a woman. Uh, I give quizzes all the time. No one thinks that's a particularly attractive quality. Don't give people quizzes. Don't ever do that. That's, that's not a way to start a conversation with someone. I mean, if someone tells you that they love opera, you know, don't ask them what you know, Pavarotti's second performance in Vienna was. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it's really odd that, yeah, but men do that. Men create these barriers and they, they create these, you know. Um, if we look at the data on this, uh, on if they, they do polls on this. They ask this, this basic question, are you a sports fan? They do this for men and women. Gallup does this poll frequently. There's something like 60 million women are sports fans in this country. Uh, it's not a small number of people. Uh, of all sports fans, 40 to 45 percent of all sports fans are women. Um, and so men tend to think this is their space. It's not, and the reason why men don't know that the women around them are sports fans is because of things like the quiz, that women just don't want to tell you this. It's of things like the quiz and also of the way that we coverage and cater sports. Mm -hmm. We only, for the most part, have the, the, the male sports fan in mind when we package things in media. And that's something that I think, you know, we're all trying to address. ESPN has done a much better job of that. ESPN has signed the WNBA um, to air these games. Now they're still making programming mistakes of when and where they do Massive that. Um, right. <laughs> but but this is, you know, but this is a whole thing. So for example, you know, if you're if you're talking about um, a woman athlete, right, and you're you're packaging a whole thing about, let's say, Serena Williams um, or, you know, um, if you're doing that in a way that focuses on how she looks and the fashion brands that she endorses and, and things like that first, before actually going to what's happening on the court, that's, that tells you all about who you're actually marketing to and who you are making these decisions for. And it's kind of a vicious cycle. If you're making these decisions that only have male sports fans in mind, you turn off women, and then you have all kinds of you know, recurring data that belie the actual truth that half of all sports fans are women that then justify further making these decisions. Exactly. I was curious, what has been your sort of uh, defense or how have, how have you managed? I mean, what do you do to kind of combat what comes at you um, in terms of these biases? I mean, I think from that quote that you read, the first and foremost thing is we can speak until the day is long about why it's a moral imperative to cover women's sports and to think of the women's sports fan, but you're not gonna change people's minds that way. The way you're gonna change people's mind is by making the very strong financial argument that you are leaving money on the table by not catering to an entire demographic that is not only half of sports fans, but at this point in our nation's history, uh, higher earning, higher educated, and has more disposable income. Um, the spending decisions, the consumer decisions that are being made are largely being made by women. And this was an argument I was making to beer brands and all kinds of you know, sports related brands uh, when I was doing some work with Nielsen where I, we had data that showed that even if you don't want to believe that half of all sports fans are women, half of all people who are buying the beer for the sports fans are women. Um, they're making those consumer decisions. Now, they are also making the decisions of what sports to watch and when they're watching them. Um, but if you don't make that financial decision, because the people who are taking that data at the top of the marketing chain, the programming chain, are still largely men who still kind of believe that the easiest path to profitability is to only cater to men. If you don't make that financial argument to them, they're never gonna listen to you. So I just, I come from it at a, at a very pragmatic sense in that in that regard and a follow-up question for all of the sports fans in the room is there anything that we can do at at our consumer level or at our level to to help to to help make to make change 
I would say just, you know, be conscious about how you talk about certain issues, how you talk about sports in front of women, but at the same time, like, we're not, we're not snowflakes, right? Um, I think that we're going through a lot of this conversation right now, and I know we're going to get into this with the Astros and Brandon Taubman, um, and, and it's, it's these kinds of environments that, you know, when you, when you are around sports fans, you know, we're just sports fans, and we might be sensitive to certain issues, and we might not be, because also women aren't a monolith, and we don't think the same way about things, but just the acknowledgement of our presence in the room and our right to be there, I think that just goes a long way. This has long been a space where even just our mere existence in this space has kind of been denied. Um, and, and, and that, you know, it's really, it's the small things. The bar is also, guys, the bar is so low. <laughs> like, the bar is so low for bringing women into the space and making us feel a little bit more comfortable and, and accepting us as, as existing here. One of the episodes, and I think it dropped today, had to do, has to do with some of the current events centering around domestic violence. And maybe, Dave, you maybe had some questions about that or had some opinions about that. We can bring that well, part of yeah, the let's conversation. Start with that. Let's, why don't you just tell, I don't know that everyone in the audience understands the story. So tell us the story of what happened with the Astros. Okay, so this is, you know, the World Series is going on right now. And... The Astros eliminated my Yankees, and it was very painful because it happened at the last minute, and DJ LeMay, who tied the game in the ninth with this crazy home run, and then Jose Altuve wins the game with a walk-off in the bottom of the ninth. Anyway, heartbroken, right? Um, so I'm rooting for the Nats, I guess, but for lots of reasons, and this is one of them, is that in that celebration this past Saturday, when the, the Astros clinched the ALCS, they clinched their birth to the World Series, they're in the locker room, and an assistant GM named Brandon Taubman, um, in the middle of the champagne uh, celebration, directed, he basically shouted at a group of women reporters that were standing in the clubhouse. And he shouted, thank God we got Osuna. I'm so effing glad we got Osuna. And he's referring to Roberto Osuna, who is the closer for the Astros. Now, Roberto Osuna was traded to the Astros last season in the middle of serving a 75-game suspension for domestic violence. Um, there are a couple of implications there. One is that the team he was on, the Toronto Blue Jays, when this suspension and when this accusation came down, didn't want him on the team anymore because he, of what he had done, and also because he was serving a 75-game suspension. So the team that makes the calculus, makes the decision to bring him on, is the Astros in the middle, again, of, this, of, this season and, and of last season and of this suspension. That's their prerogative, that's their right, but the decision making there still hinges on the idea that getting a marquee player for very cheap is, outweighs the, not just the morality, but the PR hit that you're probably gonna take from that. And that's, you know, again, that's a decision that they made. Uh, the Yankees made a same, the same decision with Aroldis Chapman, so, you know, we're not, we're not showing a bias here. But that's not what this actual issue is about. Like, we've already been living with Roberto, Roberto Asuna, Asuna being on the mound with the Astros for a season. What this was, was one of the women reporters who had taken issue with the Astros making this decision throughout the season had tweeted a domestic violence hotline number every time Osuna was on the mound. And this assistant GM had taken issue with her in the past. So there is history there. Um, Stephanie Epstein, who is a reporter for Sports Illustrated, who was one of the women that witnessed this and that um, this shouting was directed at, wrote this report on Monday basically saying what happened. And the implication there is that this was a team executive gloating about the fact that these women, these writers, other writers who aren't women who might have issue with this person being on the team, well, that doesn't matter. And you don't even really have a right to criticize that because look, like we just made the World Series. Um, and Stephanie went on outside the lines and said, you know, it felt intimidating and, and it felt unnecessary. We weren't talking about Osuna. We weren't even talking to Osuna. But this really became a story in the Astros' immediate reaction, right? Like this thing that this front office executive did was pretty reprehensible in itself. But then the Astros doubled down and they said, they, ba they, they basically said that she fabricated the story. So they called her veracity as a reporter and as a journalist into question. And when you're a journalist, that's one of the most serious charges that you can make. Now, it also was a really stupid decision 
because this happened in a room full of reporters. So almost immediately after the Astro statement came down, you had five and six people, men and women, also for the Houston Chronicle, the local paper that follows the Astros saying, no, we witnessed this happen, this absolutely happened. So the fallout from that has, has continued to progress um, in the last couple of days and, and will only continue. MLB is investigating, they have people on the ground. Um, the Astros keep releasing statements that don't make anything better. Um, but the underlying assumption here again is that there is this culture that has fostered this thing in this in this executive where he thinks it's okay to taunt a woman in the clubhouse while the team around him institutionally not only supports him doing that it seems but also uses the strategy of of trying to discredit the reporter that made this a story um, so those are two separate issues. Like we, again, we've already discussed a domestic violence issue and that needs, that always needs more discussion. But in this case, it was calling into question the credentials of a female reporter. Mm. And that just adds to the hostile environment and the unwelcoming aspect of what it's like to be a woman in this space. They've never apologized to her for calling her a They liar, haven't have they? apologized to her yet. We, we have heard that they might apologize to her, but frankly, he's, I mean, she's still gonna encounter him in the clubhouse. If the, if the Astros yeah. win the World Series, Roberto Osuna could very likely be on the mound in the ninth inning when they clinch the World Series. Now they're down two games to nothing, but still. Um, <laughs> it could happen. And, and, he, and he only gave up a two-run homer last time he did that. So exactly. That, you know. but, uh, but yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know what the right move in this situation is, but that statement they released, absolutely What was not. odd is that he was thankful for Osuna that day because no one was thankful for Osuna that day. The reason why there was a last and last, you know, why there was a homer at the end is because he gave up a homer in the previous right. and that's why he did it. And that's the thing also is that the Astros, like Jose Altuve, who won the game with his walk-off home run, is such a likable dude. I hate that I can say that because he's beaten my team twice in the last three years <laughs> um, in the ALCS, but... He's such a likable dude. Like there are likable people on the Astros, but the front office has now shifted that focus away from the players and what's happening on the field to the way that they've treated this reporter and this entire situation. And the general manager had this statement after he, he then said, like, I think it was yesterday, that we'll never know the intent of the, what the intent of the associate G. We don't know what his intent was in saying that. We can't ever know. And I think I tweeted a response to that is every time a man says something about gender issues that's inappropriate, Another man always seems to show up to say something completely obtuse to mm. defend what he's saying. It's like this never seems to end. Well, and here's the thing about that also. That statement is attempting to turn this into a he said, she said, yes. which you can't do when this happened in a room full of reporters again. Like, we already have the facts of what happened. I will, to the Astros' credit, I will give manager A.J. Hinge a lot of credit. He is the only person in that organization so far who has come out and basically said, you know, I'm disappointed in this. Well, and if this is this, you did an episode on this on the podcast, and I think it dropped today. Is it that did. right? It dropped so, this morning. if you want to know more about this issue that's really just happening right now as we speak, you can look at the podcast. The podcast is called The Lead. Is that right? The Lead, yes. And you can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts, and it's a daily podcast. Mm -hmm. So, I've been listening to it like for the last couple of weeks religiously and I love it because um, we were talking about this last night and I think that you really uh, walk this very delicate and amazing line of being there for the diehard sports fan and the really knowledgeable sports aficionado to someone like me who is a fan but maybe is not as deep into it and and I just really love that I'd love to ask you about a few of the episodes I listened to sure. and maybe get and if, if Dave has any that he wants to hear about um, you did an episode about the NBA in China mm -hmm. which is uh, a complex issue on so many levels. And um, I would love to know a little bit uh, uh, about your thoughts on it from the journalistic angle, because it, it presents complexities in everybody's personal feelings and everybody's politics and about all these different things. But from the journalist side of it, um, what can you tell me uh, about that topic and what makes it particularly complex and interesting to you. Right. Well, with this particular thing, we actually did two episodes that week. And the first one was kind of just a general explainer. What's going on? Why does this matter? Why did the Chinese government react this way? Why did the NBA react this way? Um, does everyone know, like, basically the story? Maybe if you could give us a little nutshell, so that'd be great. Houston Rockets GM Daryl Morey had tweeted, um, 
basically support for the protesters in Hong Kong. Protesters in Hong Kong are, are protesting new surveillance and security measures that the Chinese government is taking, but basically it's part of this larger fight that China is trying to repatriate, bring Hong Kong back under their jurisdiction. It's a, it's a long, decades-long fight. But so he's basically, he, he tweeted um, in support of these protesters in Hong Kong. Um, who also have been met with human rights violations. They've been, you know, water cannon in the streets. The Chinese, uh, the, the local police have, have used lethal force against them. So, so we are very much talking about, about human rights when we talk about this. But immediately after that, because of the NBA's business relationship with China, there was such a fallout. So the NBA has a, an agreement with a Chinese company called Tencent. And they basically do everything. Like it's it's kind of impossible to nail down exactly what Tencent does. They're a social media platform. They're a broadcaster. They're everything. Um, ESPN has a has a broadcast deal with Tencent as well to air NBA games in China. And immediately, they Tencent stopped airing games. And the context of this also was that the NBA was in the middle of uh, preseason games that were doing a global push. So the NBA, the Sacramento Kings and Indiana Pacers were in. Uh, were in India. There were teams playing in Japan, and there were teams uh, set to play the Lakers and who were the Lakers the playing Nets, the, Nets. the Nets. The Lakers and the Nets were set to play in China as well. Um, so then you had like there was this local aspect of it where these games that were being played in Shanghai were not being aired to a Chinese audience, um, and there you're talking billions of dollars on the table for the NBA. Um, the partnership, the NBA's partnership in, in China is valued at about four billion dollars. Um, so, you know, the NBA at this point is in a really difficult situation. They're getting pushback from the Chinese government. Um, Americans, uh, you know, op, for the most part, obviously fall on another side of this issue where they're supporting Daryl Morey. And eventually, Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, comes to releases a better statement than what the initial reaction was. And he basically said, we support Daryl Morey, we support free speech. Um, we support Daryl Morey's right to tweet this in support. We are not taking a stance, a political stance ourselves. The only political stance the NBA is, is taking at this time is supporting Daryl Morey's right to free speech and as such will not succumb to Chinese government pressure to fire Daryl Morey. So all of that happened. But this ended up becoming a whole question about what that free speech means. And then you have people, you have stars like LeBron James or James Harden uh, for the Rockets, you know, being asked questions that frankly, they're not particularly equipped to answer about you know, communist China and you know, what's happening in Hong Kong. And that's, that's an unfair position to put these players in. At the same time, these are players that we all know who have used their platforms to speak out about social issues that they are both um, very well informed about and that they personally care about. So it created this whole firestorm. The second episode that we did was focusing on the owner, the new owner of the, of the, of the I almost said New Jersey Nets, geez, um, <laughs> of the Brooklyn Nets, Joe Tsai. Um, and he had released a, an open letter on Facebook in the aftermath of this where it, he, he he basically touted a lot of, of the Chinese government's talking points. And he, tr he tried to paint it as explaining you know, to an American audience why this is such a hot button issue to Chinese nationalists. Um, but it came across as uh, you know, kind of regurgitating some of the lines that the Chinese government always, always uses in their defense. Um, so from my financial background, I was very familiar with Joe Tsai, uh, but I think Americans aren't so familiar with him. So he is the co-founder of a company called Alibaba, which you might have heard of. And when we talk about Alibaba, we only, as Americans, really know about, uh, 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 about Jack Ma, who is a much more front-facing uh, executive here. But Joe Tsai, um, you know, Taiwanese, Taiwanese Canadian, lived in the U.S., got educated here, um, and, and co-founded Alibaba in China, and, and now owns both the Liberty and the Nets. And that was an important connection to make for us because of Alibaba's very close dealings with the Chinese government. Now, listen, this is something the NBA has known for decades. David Stern, the former commissioner of the NBA, who brokered basically this partnership with China, had said this in the past, that you know, the cost of doing business in China is kind of holding your nose a little bit with, when it comes to dealing with, with a communist government. Um, 
So we wanted to demonstrate through Alibaba's close connections to the Chinese government just what that means. So for example, there is an app out there. I don't know if you're familiar with Mao's, you know, red book, but little red book, but this is, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of known colloquially as the little red app. And it is an app that basically every day um, touts Chinese uh, communist propaganda and, and kind of indoctrination and things like that. And it was directly programmed and marketed by Alibaba. And we thought that was an important thing for people to know when they're considering Joe Tsai's comments in the context of what we're talking about here. Um, and those were all really difficult but important editorial decisions that we made, right? Like we didn't want to say Joe Tsai is a communist or supports communism because we don't know that for a fact. We do know that Jack Ma is a card-carrying member of the, of the Communist Party, but we can say with integrity that there is an economic reason or at least a financial and business decision that goes into Joe Tsai making this strategic decision to put out a statement like that, and it's him being the co-founder of this company that is so closely aligned with the Chinese government. Um, I think other outlets wouldn't have handled it with as much nuance as we did, mm. and I hope that I didn't lose half the audience in that explanation. Well, that's the thing about this topic. I mean, it's it's just so layered and so complex, I think. And it was a really unfair position not only to put some of these players in, but but some of the sports writers, frankly. And, and you know, sports writers, first of all, like, I think we get a, a bad rap because we only cover sports and sports is entertainment. Um, one of my favorite... One of my favorite ways to characterize sports writers, and I'll just say this, I, I went to high school um, three blocks away from the World Trade Center. Um, some of the first reporters that were on the ground as soon as the planes hit were sports writers because we are used to running on breaking news and, and being there in the immediacy no matter what time of day, you know. Um, so, so, so that is one aspect of it. The other side of it, is the, of, of it, though, is that if you don't have a background in you know, world history or international affairs or that kind of thing, and you're trying to cover something like an NBA in China, you can miss a lot of the nuances. Mm -hmm. And that's when it's important to reach out to your sources. You mentioned the Gavin Newsom com conversation, and, and I'm sure we have some athletes in the room, and, and we're a college that's dealing with these, these issues. Um, that is a, a new bill that has passed in California to allow college athletes to use their likeness names for profit. Is that correct? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, this conversation ends to descend Ends, ends in descending in an argument over pay for play. And that's not what this is. That's, that's not what this bill does. This is a bill that allows college athletes at their discretion, at whatever their value is to the market, to profit off of their names, images, in, images and likenesses. They're called nil rights. Um, and that basically just means, listen, if, if Nike not, you know, wants to sign a player to a shoe deal while he's still with a college, as long as it doesn't interfere with the college's existing deals, um, they should be able to do that. And I think that that's, 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 that's a pretty fair way to put that. Um, so that's passed in California, and we had Governor, Governor Newsom on to talk eventually about eventually it would lead to pay for play, because at some point you would expect colleges to exploit this and say, if you come to my college, you'll have a better... Well, that is, that is the argument. Yeah. But I think the counter argument also is, how is that different than booster culture and what is already happening and some of the incentives well, the, that are built in? Yeah, this, this will be over the table, so you can sign the document in front of cameras. And for the booster one, it was the same agreement, but you just didn't have the cameras. Right, so and I think that's, difference. you know, it's a yeah. similar argument to legalizing sports betting, which is this is behavior that is already happening. And it's kind of, you know, it's a lovely thought to think that uh, we can maintain the purity of amateurism, but which that's never just, existed, which by the never way. Existed. <laughs> never existed. Um, never existed. And we actually, we just ran an episode that I really loved. Um, about SMU. SMU is ranked for the first time since receiving the death penalty uh, in, in 1987. And SMU's, the SMU received the death penalty. Basically, the NCAA gave them the harshest penalty in the history of the NCAA, um, where they gutted their recruiting rights, they shut down the program, all of that, because of recruiting violations. And it's very quaint to think about the types of things that led to the death of this program that is now slowly 30 years being resurrected in the context of the kinds of money that we're actually seeing being passed around 
that's under the table. Yeah. Now, California is not the only state. Is that there are there yes. are others who are as well passing? Is that right? Other states are passing it. Um, there's some there's there's a there's a congressman named Anthony Gonzalez, not Tony Gonzalez, the uh, uh, the former Arizona Cardinal, um, but Anthony Gonzalez uh, in Ohio. Uh, who is is trying to get a similar bill passed? Um, but we also actually recently interviewed uh, Senator Cory Booker. That episode will drop next week. About he's trying to use these statewide bills and take them national. But he's also going much more much more broad from that. He wants to form a federal commission to oversee all sports, not just college sports. We should talk a little bit about that. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. So that's. So this is Cory Booker's idea. He wants to create a federal commission for all of sports in the United States. Now, how do other countries deal with sports? So the United States is actually an outlier where we don't have a centralized governing board to oversee professional and amateur sports. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the United Kingdom, the UK, has a minister of sport. She is a member of parliament from the Conservative oh, Party, um, but she oversees these kinds of things. And you know, it's it's everything from giving more coverage to women's sports. You know, she has made impassioned pleas about that. But in the United States specifically, and and we talked about this with Senator Booker. There are other things like FCC blackout restrictions, right? If you live in an area that has a couple of teams in your in your market, but not directly in your market, you can't actually watch your local team. That is something that uh, people argue to the FCC is in violation of the of, of antitrust law. Major League Baseball, I don't know if everybody knows this, Major League Baseball has been antitrust exempt since there was a Sherman Act. Um, and every time it's been challenged, you know, the Supreme Court, it goes up to the Supreme Court, this has happened three times, I believe, uh, since the initial ruling. Every time it's been challenged, uh, the Supreme Court rules that precedent is too strong to overturn. If you think about that though, what was the original precedent? In the 1920s, when Major League Baseball was granted this antitrust exemption, it was done so because baseball is not interstate commerce. Now let's take a moment and realize how ridiculous that notion is, right? Mm -hmm. Baseball, even in the 1920s, before it was this $10 billion industry, you still had players traveling across state lines to play games. You still had radio stations broadcasting these games across state lines. So the idea that a lot of these laws that we still uphold 100 years later, um, in some cases, were based on a time when we didn't actually know how burgeoning and how big the industry and the business of sports could be. So obviously we need to modernize our laws in that way. And I think yeah. that's part of the rationale behind Senator Booker, I'm going to let him speak for himself, behind his federal commission, is that there are ways in which we should be regulating these, these industries that are big businesses but have certain exemptions outside of, of, of laws that are supposed to govern businesses of this side, size. And we don't need to get into the wonkiness of tax law, but for example, like the way that you tax a business league, which the NFL technically is, versus another group of businesses is, is an interesting exemption there. <laughs> and the courts, the courts have typically ruled on sports as sports fans, not as, as judges. So the um. law, it typically is. Uh, for instance, this came up when uh, the Northwestern football case where they were asking whether or not football players are employees or not. And so it's pretty clear football players are employees. If you look at the, at the legal definition of employee, you, are, you have a manager, you are compensated, that's an employee. Uh, the court ruling on that from the National Labor Relations Board was they didn't rule. That was their actual ruling. That it came to them. It was out of their jurisdiction. And they said, we are not ruling. So are they employees? We're not saying. That's our ruling. Our ruling is we're not going to tell you. It's a secret. You're like, I didn't know that was one of your choices. It was either yes or no. No. The other option is we're just not going to tell you. So the other thing about Europe that's interesting is that, and I don't know if Cory Booker got into this, but uh, for a very long time, professional sports in Europe were regulated to that you cannot make a profit on professional sports. Owners are not supposed to do that. Huh, You're supposed right. to do this as a public service. Right. Wow. And so European sports has tiers. Uh, if you finish in last place in the Premier League in England, you get demoted down to the minor leagues. That's the penalty for losing. Uh, I grew up as a Lions fan. The penalty for losing for the Lions is they get number one draft picks. That's, the, that's <laughs> what they get, which just encourages them to keep on losing, which they've done for 60 years. So. Right. And listen, we've had the promotion and relegation debate um, 
throughout, especially when it comes to soccer in this country, but throughout like the history of sports here versus in the UK. And that's its own thing. I will say that having that model in the UK specifically has not hurt the profitability of sports. Soccer players over there are more highly paid than even the highest paid players. They certainly are today. They certainly are today. Well, yes. amazingly, we're we're running out of time, Sorry. which is, is <laughs> really something. Um, but I do want to ask you about your upcoming project, which is your book. But before we leave that, the podcast is called The Lead. Mm -hmm. um, but getting back into writing, you have a huge project that, that's coming out soon. Um, could you tell us just a little bit about, about what that is? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm writing a book. We are slated. We just got our first peer review back. Um, we Yay. are slated tentatively for publication in the fall of next year. Um, I'm, uh, you know, the, I'm writing the book with uh, Jessica Luther, who is a, an investigative journalist. She broke the Baylor football uh, college sexual assault scandal. She's very, very well known, very respected in this space. Um, and the and it's for the University of Texas Press. And the working title of the book is How to Love Sports When They Don't Love You Back. Mm. Um, and basically, every chapter deals with a different moral dilemma of sports fandom and how we maintain our fandom despite those things. So some of some of the topics are very serious and very heavy. So for example, how you root for the team with the player who's been accused of violence against women, and I, you know, so much of so many of us have been there, and and that's a hard thing for us. And the kinds of ways that we navigate those those difficult spaces, and for this book particularly, you know, I most of my career I've been a columnist, so it's been my job to give an informed opinion, analysis, and commentary. In this capacity, I was purely a reporter, so obviously I have my own opinions on these things, but I asked other people how they navigated these spaces. Um, so that's one. Another chapter, for example, which is a little bit more fun, is how to love your team when you hate your owner. Uh, and there are very serious reasons to hate your owner, but there are also, you know, Half, half, half of that chapter just descended into Knicks fans complaining about James Dolan, which is always fun. Um, so, so that, and that, and, and it really just comes down to this idea of what, what sports fandom means to us, how individual that is, how diverse and varied that is, and how, you know, the different degrees in which we experience our, our sports fandom, how closely tied to our identities, our hometowns it can be, or our family histories in some, in some directions. Um, and then, you know, we started writing this book before this whole national conversation about cancel culture really started coming about. But, but that's kind of where the book lands in, in the current conversation is, you know, how, how do we judge whether art or sports or something that brings us pure joy and entertainment is worth overlooking some of these other things? And, you know, I think where we land in, in doing these interviews is it's not my job to be the you know the moral arbiter for other people's fandom and that you know those decisions are made on such an individual and varied basis. Ah, exciting. Well, we'll look forward to that coming next year. Thank you. Um, sort of to close, I always like to ask us uh, what advice, you know, we were college students in the room and what advice might you have for 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 men and women looking perhaps to get into journalism, sports journalism, sports writing, maybe want to do what you do. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have? Um, well, journalism at large, first of all, it's not a dying industry, it's just shifting. And I, I, I don't say this to be navel gazing or self aggrandizing, but it's such an important institution in the way this country is run and being skeptical and asking questions and doubting when authority tells you things as fact. Like that's, that's the reason you're in school, right? That's what you're kind of learning to do. You've got like a number one doubter right here. Um, <laughs> just knock on his door. You know? <laughs> um, and and it's, it's, it's just such an important check. It's part of our system of checks and balances. It's the reason we're called it the fourth estate. So please, you know, if, if it's something that you're interested in, go into. The advice that I'll have is, you know, don't, don't pigeonhole what journalism is and can be, um, but always be diligent. And there are things that we can learn. You know, we talk about this divide between old media and new media. And I've been very lucky in my career to have mentors who are very well established in both, right? Like I came up at the Huffington Post um, when the Huffington Post was this burgeoning, amazing, vibrant place to work. And then I went to Bloomberg and all of my editors were veterans, Pulitzer Prize winners from the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Um, so I've been very lucky to have that bridge throughout my career. But 
what's been the common denominator is that from the people that I worked with at HuffPost and and Bloomberg and ESPN and now The Athletic, which is a startup where we're you know, basically experimenting on this new model of subscription journalism. What's been the common denominator is that every person that I've worked for has known what they don't know and has known the questions to ask in order to fill those gaps. And whether it's in running a company or a journalistic enterprise or just in doing the journalism itself, this goes back to the question of a sports writer covering the intricacies of you know, a trade war between the US and China, recognize what you don't know and ask those questions and just read a lot. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, the podcast is called The Lead. You can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. It's a daily podcast. It's so cool. Um, I'd like to take the time. If you're interested in more, Kavitha will be on the radio with me at 3 p.m. and um, We'll turn that into a podcast on the Apex Hour podcast, another podcast to check out and listen to. But uh, to close today, I'd just like to say thank you so much to Dave Barry and thank you so much to Kavitha Davidson for your time today and for sharing your expertise with our our audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.